Good morning. Happy Mulud Nobil to uh, Muslim viewers. And uh, wishing you, everyone, all our viewers this morning, a restful holiday from all of us here at Channels Television. You're welcome. Even though it's a holiday, we still have to do business here on Business Morning. I'm Ini John Mekwa, and we'll do this together in the next 55 minutes. We'll start with global oil prices. It's still uh, uh, actually selling today. It's an active market. This morning we see that prices fell, snapping five days of gains as investors took profits after a report on slowing economic activity in China, which is the world's biggest crude importer, reignited concerns about falling global fuel demand. Brent's crude features for December settlement fell by as much as 1.1 percent and was last down 85 cents uh, at $97.07 cents a barrel. West Texas intermediate crude for November delivery declined by 1.1 percent at $91.84 a barrel. Services activity in China during September contracted for the first time in four months as COVID-19 restrictions hit demand and business confidence. The slowdown in the economy of China, which is the world's second largest oil consumer after the United States, adds to growing concerns about a possible global recession triggered by numerous central banks' interest rates to combat high inflation rates. Well, still staying in the market now, but let's uh, move over to the commodities market now. U.S. soybean futures rose with bargain buying in focus after prices fell to their lowest since late July. Uh, all three commodities traded in both positive and negative territory with concerns about tightening world supplies providing support while worries about a weakening global economy cutting into demand limiting, limited the strength. Chicago Board of Trade soybean features for November delivery uh, settled up nine cents at thirteen dollars sixty seven cents a bushel. We're in Nigeria now, and uh, one of the hottest topics in the business scene is the 2023 budget. The president, President Muhammad Buhari, presented that on Friday to the joint uh, the, uh, sitting of the National Assembly, both the House of Representatives and the Senators. And uh, we saw an increase from the proposed budget, which was about 19 trillion naira to 20.51 trillion naira. Let's take this report and get some of those details, and then we'll drill down on it on a conversation afterwards. The Senate President leads Senators into the House of Representatives' makeshift chamber as lawmakers await the arrival of President Muhammad Buhari for his eighth and final budget presentation. The budget presentation is coming on the same day as the 2022 appropriation bill, which was presented on the 7th of October 2021. At exactly 10.07 a.m., the President walks in to a warm reception from the lawmakers. Before the president's presentation, the Senate's president, Ahmed Lawan, who prides in the National Assembly maintaining the January to December budget cycle, gives his remarks. The large-scale and massive stealing of our oil is concerning as this reduces drastically the revenues available to the government. Then it's time for the main event, the presentation of the 2023 appropriation bill. But first, the president speaks about the performance of the 2022 budget so far. The sum of 8.29 trillion naira had been spent by July 31st, 2022, out of the total appropriation of 17.32 trillion naira. Despite our revenue challenges, we have consistently met our debt service commitments, staff salaries, and statutory transfers have also been paid as and when due. The president elicits a reaction from the lawmakers when he asks them not to go against the rules. The current practice where some committees of the National Assembly purport to pass budgets for government-owned enterprises, which are at variance with the budgets sanctioned by me and communicate such directly to the MDAs is against the rules and needs to stop, please. <laughs> Na 
Nigeria require. It is still my turn. He then presents the 2023 appropriation bill. The 2023 appropriation, therefore, is a budget of fiscal sustainability and transition. Total federally distributable revenue is estimated at 11.09 trillion Naira in 2023, while total revenue available to fund the 2023 federal budget is estimated at 9.73 trillion Naira. A total of expenditure of 20.51 trillion Naira is proposed for the federal government in 2023. Of the 20.51 trillion Naira proposed for 2023, Statutory transfers stand at 744.1 billion naira. Non-debt recurrent expenditure is expected to go up 8.27 trillion naira. Capital expenditure 5.35 trillion naira, and debt servicing 6.31 trillion naira. While sinking funds will go up 247.73 billion naira. The president then seizes the moment to address the issue of the striking university lecturers. We expect the staff of these institutions to show a better appreciation of the current state of affairs in the country. In the determined effort to resolve the issue, we have provided a total of 470 billion Naira in the 2023 budget from our constrained resources for revitalization and salary enhancements in the tertiary institutions. Distinguished Senators and Honourable Members, it is instructive to know that today government alone cannot provide the resources required for funding tertiary education. And for one last time, President Muhammad Buhari lays the 2023 budget. In concluding the proceedings, the Speaker of the House of Representatives assures of a speedy and thorough process as he speaks directly to the heads of MDAs. And we will exercise the full authority of Parliament to hold to account those who fail to provide the records we need to make informed decisions on the appropriation bill. According to the President, 15.2 billion naira has been provided in the budget to scale up measures for safer learning environments in schools, just as defense and internal security have been given top priority. He promises that insecurity will be curtailed before the end of his administration, as he intends to leave a legacy of a peaceful and prosperous nation. Terry Ikumi, Channels Television News. That's right. Uh, details of uh, that presentation of the 2023 appropriation bill for next year, 2023. Let's drill down on the details of it with uh, co-managing partner, commercial partners, uh, Mr. Steve Osho, uh, joining us from here in Lagos. Good afternoon, Mr. Osho. Happy holiday to you. Thank you so much for sharing this holiday with us. Thank you. Good morning. It's my pleasure to be here. Awesome. So um, let's let's start from well, should I say the top? Of course, this is not our first budget. This is the final one for President Muhammad Buhari before he leaves office. But let's even look at the rate of implementation, impact, performance of our budgets over the years. I mean, not just talking about this, this administration, but I mean, if we do this administration, I guess it's been seven years, we can actually do that. How, what percentage would you place that? Okay, thank you. Um, I think um, like it's been teamed or termed um, is the budget of um, sustainability and is the last one that this present administration or this present government um, is going to preside over until when they hand over uh, the mantle of leadership in 2023. Um, if you look at the, the history of our budget since this government has been in place for the past three years, um, I think the major challenge has actually been in the transmissions of the revenue. Um, the revenue has actually been the challenge for this government. If you look at the number that has actually been turned for this year, 
um, 9.7 trillion is projected for revenue out of the 20.5 trillion. That's circa about 47 billion dollars, um, which shows an increase of about 18 percent from the last year budget of 17.1 uh, thereabouts. Um, so, for me, um, you've seen that slight increase in terms of um, the budget. Uh, for 2023, and at the same time, we've seen that the revenue projected for this year is likely lower for uh, than what was projected in 2022. 2022, we had about 10.7 trillion, and if you look at that data from the prorata uh, basis, on prorata basis from where we are today, you would agree with me that we only performed about 45 to 50 percent of that revenue projection in 2022. The same thing in 2021, we had performance over 70%, roughly 70% in terms of revenue projections and the actual um, that was actually gotten from revenue. Um, 2021, we projected about 6.64 trillion and actual number for that year was about 4.64 trillion. And in 2020, the same thing, we had about 5.37 projected in 2020 and we had about 3.42 in terms of revenue, which is roughly about 60 uh, to 65 percent of um, actualization. So in this budget of 2023, I think the same problem actually exists. Uh, if you look at the projection, if you look at the presentation by the by the president, I think one, you know, he has both the plus and the minus. So the plus for me, um, I think we can see that uh, the government is aspiring to get about 3.75 projections in terms of GDP which um, is slightly higher than the uh, population growth, which is around 2.4% uh, as at the last statistic released by MBS. And um, I can see there that the president was actually acknowledging the fact that it's not going to be business as usual, and it's becoming more and more difficult for, Ni for Nigerian government to actually fund you know, university. So we threw another debate up you know, into how this is going to you know, happen going forward, considering the fact that we had seven months of strike by um, ASU. Then again, if you look at the budget again, the subsidy is, um, is still hanging in the balance somehow, somewhere, which they're saying they're going to kick down the road, uh, oh, sorry, removed by 2023, but we don't know how that will be done. And um, the deficits, I think that's another thing we have to look at, because if you look at the revenue of 9.7 trillion, we have a de deficit of 11 trillion. And if you look at the entire expenditure of 20.51 trillion, um, if you take about 6.3, it's about 6.3 trillion out of that number, which is going to be, you know, uh, through interest payment or debt servicing, it means that the actual number that's going to go to expenditure or to, you know, capital projects and recurrent expenditure that's always happened in the budget is roughly about 14 trillion naira. Um, and if you take that out from the deficits that we have, it means that quite a lot of money is going to be raised from the capital market. Mm. Well, uh, capital markets, uh, well, that, I think that's another development. But uh, before we delve into those uh, uh, details, I'd like to know from your perspective, because an average Nigerian watching this program would ask, okay, so the president comes, reels out numbers, you know, to place subsidy at this and, and place the Naira at this and project that we're going to have a revenue at this level and GDP at this level. How does it concern me? Well, so it concerns you because some of those statistics you see that economic macroeconomic data that if it's actually well planned will affect um, a lot of things that actually impact the citizens. Uh, we're talking about amounts that government is going to spend on infrastructure, which means that infrastructure is going to develop, you know, and you're going to have an improved system. So which means that it's going to affect the citizens. We're talking about how much is going to be deployed into some other projects, you know, um, whether it's power, energy, um, road infrastructure, water, water um, um, development and all of that, which means that these have a direct impact on the government. And we're talking about actually projecting the economy to actually move at 3.75 GDP, which means that it can urbanize the economy that total productions of the entire uh, population of the country is actually improved. 
you know, which is why I mentioned the, uh, the fact that if you are projecting about 3.75 for 2023, which is higher than, you know, the population growth in 2023, sorry, in 2022, uh, it means it's actually good for the economy, which means that Nigerian or uh, the economy is actually producing more uh, considering our size of GDP. So these are the things that directly impact the citizens. And these are why, and that's the reason why for government and for governance, a lot of things have to go into that calculation. You know, um, the exchange rate, for example, is going to affect, you know, um, you know, importer, you know, business um, or manufacturers, you know, uh, and transmission of all of those mechanisms will affect how the economy is galvanized one way or the other. So those statistics and those parameters are actually being set across are very important and things that government should watch. Inflation, for example, we know is a thief of, you know, uh, of, 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 of income. So which means that if we are able to tame inflation from this present level, we've seen 17 year high at 20, over 20 percent, and um, the projection is around 17 percent for 2023. If we are able to actually tame that and actually bring the interest, uh, the inflation rate lower, it means that you know you can save more, actually earn more in terms of income. So these numbers are very important. They are macro macroeconomic data that the government have to look at. And it means that in transmission of the budget projected for 2023 and beyond, we have to look at how we can put all these parameters together to you know uh, move the economy forward. Yeah, well, I, I guess the citizens will be asking that because this year we also had uh, some funds allocated for infrastructure. And if we were to ask, where are those infrastructures? Um, where, where is the power, for instance? We, we've talked about the national grid collapse, I think, seven or eight times already this year. So I, I guess the reality of it is what the citizens are asking, and that is what they're asking for them to be able to connect you know, and be concerned when we hear this number. So it goes beyond being numbers to becoming a reality. If this amount of money is, is to fund infrastructure, what infrastructure should I be looking at at the end of 2023? Should I say, for instance, the Lagos Ibadan Expressway would have been completed? And I will know, oh, that fund that was allocated in the 2023 budget was used for this. So when the president or the next president is talking the next time and saying, oh, infrastructure is going to have five trillion naira and it's going to be used for this i'll be like yes you know and, and i'm following i guess those are kind of the realities that nigerians want to see and and connect with so i think you're quite spot on on your analysis there so just to give you a background on that your know, nigerians wants to see you know the fruits of the democracy and the fruits of those democracies are those things that the government have put in place of actually promise that are going to deliver so if you promise infrastructure we have to see that infrastructure we've seen a bit of improvement in rail infrastructure but security is still a problem we've seen a bit of improvement in terms of the road infrastructure but we still have so much um, actually to do in that area. So I think you are spot on. The problem for Nigerian government over the years has actually been the implement implementation of the promises and actually the uh, numbers of those things actually been put on the, on, on, on the budget. The assumption is that you assume that you have um, the revenue to be able to drive that. So the bane of Nigerian government is actually the drive of revenue. So if you see constantly, you're having recurring expenditure that you are using the revenue that is actually being short to finance. So it will be a problem. So there will be a gap. And if you look at the way Nigerian budget has actually been uh, performing for the past three or four or five years, you will agree with me that even CAPEX has actually been over underperforming underwhelming. Because if you look at it, 70% for this year is already been, is just what is achieved on CAPEX. But when you look at the recurrent expenditure, we've been going above you know, um, the projected amount, which is over 100 percent and what is the required expenditure which is going to you know personnel costs and all of that you know paying salaries and stuff like that so that is where the problem and that's the reason why we're not seeing you know the effect and implementation of some of those infrastructural projects that government needs to actually do power for example you've seen that uh, you know epileptic supply in power electricity for the past few years and we've seen that promises that government is trying to put push a lot of money into that sector so we need you know deliberate effort from the government and we need the conscious effort to be able to reduce the cost on governance. So we have a combination of both structural 
and you know governance issue that we, ha we have to look at here so in terms of overhead of personnel in terms of you know representative of some of those uh, uh you know government agencies and um you know mdas like that so we need to look at all of this and how to cut down expenses if you do that we'll be able to save a lot of money and if we increase the revenue by you know expanding the track the tax net you know and at the same time looking for other other areas apart from oil sectors noise oil sectors have not been you know fully developed in nigeria have not been fully tapped into you have to create that enabling environment to be able to you know allow those non-oil receipts to actually give us more revenue as a, as, as a nation and once that is done you will see that the dependence of reliance on oil which is actually, you know, um, from, from the figure we've seen this year, is actually short of the target that the government has put in place, will give us the leverage and the power to be able to perform and deliver all those promises on infrastructure. Yeah, so one of the things you said there really caught my attention, and I think the president did mention it, the issue of cutting the cost of governance. Uh, and one of the conversations that have been going on is why can't those MDAs, um, that generates revenue. Why can't they take care of their expenses? Maybe as a way of cutting costs. So at least those personnel, personnel expenses and everything that you talked about would be reduced. Do you see this as workable? So, you know, when I was explaining earlier, I, I was talking about, you know, the structural problem. is a plethora of structural and governance problem that we have to look at and we'll find a way to solve. Okay, you just mentioned there some of the MDAs and GOEs that you know we need to strip and see how much these people can actually generate and reduce the cost so that we don't have multiplicity of or uh, duplication of you know functions of some of these things, uh, some of these uh, ministries. So, and, and I think when we do that, we'll be able to save a lot of cost and a lot of money in that area. And I think from the 2023 project, um, if it's happening right, I think there's a there's a recommendation to actually strip about 10 of the GOEs um, out of the over 60 over 68 GOEs we have. And if that is fully implemented, it's a test case scenario to see how they will perform in 2023. If that case scenario actually works well in 2023, it means that we're going to have a lot of saving coming from these ministries and government parastatus, and we are going to have the efficiency of that government, of that uh, ministry being, you know, generally driven to give results. Mm. But uh, seeing that a major part of this budget, the 2023 budget, would have to be implemented by another administration, which, you know, could be an APC, and then we hope there will be continuity, but could also be an opposition, you know, which may mean that the, the, the opposition party may not have the same vision that this administration is proposing. So uh, those proposals now, is there anything that can assure Nigerians that it doesn't matter who comes in, this implementation, the implementation, because that's why we're talking about the issue of implementation of the budget. Sometimes we have them there as the letters, and they're great ideas with the potential of great results, but we don't see those results because somewhere along the line implementation, because this budget will largely be implemented by another administration. How are we sure, how can we assure that these suggestions that sound laudable would be implemented for that result? So, so just to answer your question directly, we're not sure of anything. <laughs> what we're sure of is that there's going to be transition from power from this government to another government in 20, come 2023. Um, whether this new government is going to implement fully the same budget that actually been pushed forward by this government is what we are not sure of. But one thing that is that is constant that we know, and all the major contestants um, this time around from different parties, whether it's APC, PDP, Labour Party, SDP, or whatever party that it is, they understand that Nigeria is in a very precarious situation when it comes to the economy, and it's something we have to fix. So which means that it's not going to be business as usual in 2023, considering the state of the nation. And which means that whoever wants to be the president, whether they align with the budget being presented by this APC government or not, might have to do even much more to be able to you know, give that dividend of democracy to a lot of Nigerians. That's number one. Number two, it means that we have to look at some other areas where we can improve the efficiency in our budgeting going forward, which is very important. 
because that is going to determine a lot of things. And we have to look at the structural foundation of some of these, you know, um, the other arms of government, whether it's state, you know, federal and local government. So it's a lot of work that's going to be done. Whether they are going to do it effectively, we're not sure of that. But like I said, I think one thing is sure that we're going to have a transfer of power from now, uh, in 20, from, 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 from 2023, May 2023, I believe we're going to have a new regime, whether it's from APC, PDP, or Labour, or any other party, we're going to have that. But I think whether they are going to implement what this budget, um, what this government has in their budget for 2023, uh, we're not sure of that. But I'm sure that a lot of them are aware that it's not business as usual, and they must be ready because it's not going to be an Eldorado in 2023. All right, uh, Mr. Steve Oshaw, we do wish there was a way we could assure and be sure that once we have an agreed budget that it will be implemented. But uh, I guess some things we just have to hope and pray. Thank you so much for your time and uh, this holiday. Enjoy the rest of the holiday. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. I guess uh, this conversation obviously is one that will continue in the, uh, the coming days. But uh, away from that now, have you ever thought of an insurance as an instrument for financial freedom? Or is it just a way to save? Well, find out what uh, are the details of both and then you decide for yourself which parts you want to choose. But that's after the break here on Business Morning on Channels Television. <music> Welcome back. The insurance industry in Nigeria recorded about 369.2 billion naira in the second quarter of this year, indicating a 20.1% growth rate compared to the same period of the previous year and an impressive 65% quarter-on-quarter quarter growth. The non-live segment maintained its primacy at 59.3% of the total premium generated. Oil and gas uh, was the leading driver, 32.5%. In distant second, we had 20.7% for fire motor insurance. Uh, motor insurance stood at 14.8%, while marine and aviation uh, accident and miscellaneous reported a share of 12.3 percent well let's uh, drill into this uh, industry and see some of the developments uh, an area that some nigerians might think is kind of irrelevant but i have someone who's been working at this for a while now to tell us the relevance and how it will affect you we have mr ikerete olagami con his uh, convener insurance september he joins us from our Abuja studio. Good morning, uh, Mr. Igam. Thank you so much for joining us and happy holiday to you. Happy holiday to you. Uh, All right. Yeah, so let's start by asking these numbers that we see, do they indicate growth in the insurance industry generally in the country? Well, it, 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 it indicates growth for those who are um, studying the um, uh, environment in terms of the reports. However, I am looking at um, the impact on the lives of the people. What is this doing for the lives of the people? Uh, we have an industry that is um, uh, doing a lot for the corporate entities, uh, but very little, you know, for the um, individuals for the for the for the for the citizens they say so um that's what i'm looking for and um, most of the time when i look for that it doesn't show a lot of um hope as we see on this other side so uh where do you trace that that disconnect from that even though we see growth in numbers from your perspective is not impactful growth. Where is the disconnect? Well, the disconnect is um, where it has been, I would say, for a very long time, where we always talk about insurance awareness, insurance awareness, insurance um, education for even the policyholders. And um, you find a situation where um, someone is happy to have insurance when he's working in the corporate environment. Uh, however, the moment he leaves that environment, he doesn't have insurance anymore. He doesn't feel uh, he needs insurance. So the question is, why does he feel that way? Because he has never understood the value of insurance. 
Maybe because he hasn't understood that the value of insurance is because we, they haven't felt the impact. For instance, a lot of people get the third party insurance for vehicles only because they are compelled right. to. How many people actually use it or how useful is it? A lot of people do not trust the system because it seems when it's time for the insurance to come through, there are so many details and bureaucracy and stories that stall the impact that the people are looking for. So people lose confidence in the system. Okay, you are right. You are right. However, you are right. However, um, where it begins from, by my understanding, is that people don't even understand that the third party or whatever policy you have from insurance is a contract. And so, um, if you have a contract, you should read the contract and understand what the contract says. If you feel you don't have time to read the contract, you should engage um, either an insurance broker or any other person, your lawyer, to read through it and point out things to you so that you can understand that you are well protected. And so, when people don't read their policy documents, which are, the, I mean, the contract document that they have, when something happens, you've not read it, oh, and you hear a lot of, oh, I didn't know, and I didn't, I didn't, I didn't just know, I didn't, oh, maybe because I didn't read it. And I have seen a lot of executive, executives, top executives who say this when something goes wrong. And the question is, why didn't you read it? You know, but having said that, when the claim now happens, which is the point, which is the moment of truth for, for any insurance company, what is expected as a business is to be able to, you know, make the customer feel comfortable despite the mistake that he has made. And some companies do it, some companies cannot do it uh, because they have different issues. Maybe at that time they are financially stressed, you know, and nobody is watching to say, oh, even if you are financially stressed, you have made this commitment, you have to pay this. And if you're not paying this, then you have to make a commitment to pay and stay with that commitment. A lot of the time, that process is not well checked. So people suffer through that process. And then, you know, people have heard that insurance, you can't trust them, insurance, you can't trust them. Please, it's not only insurance that you can't trust in this country. However, that of insurance has been taken from generation to generation. And you have also seen where in spite of insurance paying claims, I mean, last year, as we read the numbers, insurance paid over 250 billion as insurance. Where did that money come from? Where did that money go? Most of the time, we don't discuss that. We only discuss the ones that have not been done. So there's a gap which we are all trying to fill by way of communication. So since we are trying to fill that gap, uh, Ms. Daikon, and I mean, you guys in the insurance industry, you do know there's a gap. Why is it not possible for you to help the customers with those fine prints which they miss? For instance, if I'm going to buy an insurance for my house, for instance, why can't you educate me and say, these are the risks, these are the fine prints which I may not, you know, um, May, to, may not be so obvious to me. If this happens, why don't you help clients to understand? That way you're helping more Nigerians get confident about the insurance system and also it makes the insurance even more active. Yeah, you are, you are very correct. And that's why I said we are doing something to close the gap. Now, a lot of people were not even discussing insurance before now because it was seen as something you do for yourself and it is between you and your insurance company. Um, however, you know, the gap that the way we are trying to close the gap is by some activities that we are doing um, either on our own path or on the path of um, the insurance company. But unfortunately, you know, um, Insurance companies are also, you know, not doing it the way they should do it. The, 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 the communication is poor, in my own view. Uh, the communication is, is not effective, in my own view. You cannot do what you don't know. So uh, you don't see a lot of insurance companies engaging, you know, um, brand marketing companies. Uh, if you begin to count, you might not find more than 10 insurance companies that have 
brand marketing companies that they are working with. Uh, and so we have seen that gap, for example. Insurance September, for example, is about engaging policyholders and enabling them to share their experiences and expectations. And we interact and are able to um, get, get to close the gap in terms of knowledge. And what we did the last time, last month, was to do it with farmers, strictly with farmers. And the outcomes have been, have been well you know, um, uh, uh, applauded. And that is what we expect is happening with, with a lot of other small groups that are trying to do, to do this. I mean, you have a population of over, over 200 people. And even if you have a population of adults of over 160 million people, you know, um, you, you can imagine how you begin to engage. Now, it's not, that, it's not to say that it is, it is uh, too much to engage, but you, know, you first of all have to correct what had been wrong and now creates a new impression. I'm, I don't think it's, it's a tough call, but we just find out that it's not been very, uh, it is a need for change of culture on the part of the insurance companies and even the regulator. Because a lot of the time we are responding to calls that have uh, been made about complaints and all of that. Why, do, why don't we become a bit more proactive and make these things you know, accessible? Uh, there are all sorts of social media platforms these days, but you, you can hardly find um, a number of um, insurance companies there. Maybe if you count, like I have done sometime in the past, there are not more than 12 out of 55 companies that are on, on, on Twitter. And this is a challenge. How do you get them? Because when they even come on Twitter, including the regulator, the first thing they hear is, I have a claim. And instead of engaging the person and taking it further, you know, you find out that there's no post in three days after, after such a time. So it's understanding this. If you don't understand it, like I said earlier, engage people who understand it, and they will do the job for you. Mm, all right. So it sounds like you guys have a lot of work to do. But in just a minute or so, because it's almost time for a break, should insurance be seen as an instrument for protection or financial freedom? Oh, insurance is certainly an instrument for, financial, for financial protection. Because um, if you acquire a new thing, even if you steal a new thing, you want to protect it. <laughs> that's the, that's the natural, natural uh, thing to do. Um, like I said in a recent uh, uh, advisory for this October, I said, <clears throat> why don't we have a lot of financial gurus talking about insurance? Because sometimes they don't just take time to understand what insurance is. All they understand is that I had an experience with an insurance company and uh, they are no good. Even from policy maker's position, they bring their personal experience in insurance into it. But we know what insurance is doing for other economies anywhere. When you hear that an economy is resilient, it's about insurance. And in, in Nigeria, there are a number of different companies who are enjoying insurance quietly. And it amazes me when we discuss how to uh, expose the industry to other people, uh, somebody will say, oh, I paid claims of over, we paid claims of over three billion to a particular company that was gutted by fire. And nobody has said anything about it. Simply because some people believe that, oh, uh, the clients will not like it. And I say, why wouldn't the client like it? <laughs> why wouldn't the client like it? So it's promoting our business and promoting the clients also that he did insurance is, is uh, it's a good thing that you did insurance. Insurance got value for, 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 for the client. So All why right. would the, the client want uh, value for other people? Okay. You know? All right. Uh, Mr. Karete. Mr. Karete. Hola, Gamikon. Thank you so much. Convener Insurance September. Obviously, more conversations will need to be held on insurance and its impact. And as you noted, the insurance companies themselves have some work to do. Let's take a break now. After the break, uh, well, it's a holiday. The markets may not be open in Nigeria, but we do have a recap, a summary of how the market fared last week. But the crypto market never sleeps. We'll do all of that after the break. This is Business Morning on Channels Television. time on Business Morning here on Channels Television and we have Will Ebong joining us for that. Uh, Will, good morning. Good morning, Nini. Yes, um, 
<laughs> you know, I've not been able to get over that three point. Was it three point six? It's a on lot Thursday. of money. That was Thursday, yeah. It's it's a lot of money to to wrap one's head around to say the market is losing. We're expecting well at a time when we think we should be expecting some explosive growth in the markets and seeing maybe market movers taking advantage of the deep and buying. Then you know, we went now even the deeper, and then we're going deeper. You're wondering that was where, that was a hard that was harsh. It, it's, it's a three point three. That's I think the, it was three point six percent. Two, three, two, Two three percent. I think that's the biggest one day drop yes. I've seen in weeks, in months. In months, it's, in I've, months. I've, I've not seen that. And kind of Gary Gu couldn't help the matter. Eight hundred and fifty billion shed in one day. And Gary Gu couldn't help it. Gary Gu couldn't help it. <laughs> MTN Nigeria is still the biggest movers and shakers in the market. I think. Apparently. I think it was a combination of MTN and, and Airtel, G Africa, Airtel that yes. day. Yeah. They kind of they, they showed their you know their wings. They showed we can fly. Don't worry. Don't worry. We'll, we'll get the jeep this week. <laughs> <laughs> we get our investors. You know, take advantage and buy and talk the market around because yeah. what we're seeing is not very positive and that kind of like flowed into the fx space we saw uh, the nigerians fx reserves declining further by 153 million naira to close at 38.1 billion dollars alone 153 million dollars to close at one 38.1 uh, billion dollars the fx reserves keeps declining you know uh, month on month saying at uh, october the 6th that was the figure we had now trading activity that mirrored in the fx market where we saw a dip of 53.85 percent to close at 399.1 million dollars low transactions activities in that space as well fx spot where we zoom into the i and e window we see that the uh, the market dropped by 33.22 percent to close at 376 uh, million uh, dollars there and of the derivatives dropped by about 92.3 percent to 23.1 uh, million dollars continue to see a dip in that segment as well and we're wondering what's really happening is it the type of liquidity in the system that's causing this or some of the factors that we are not really seeing or the macroeconomics at the moment but we'll have our analysts analyze that now we saw that the INE even being though as I mentioned was 33.2 percent down but meanwhile when we look at the Naira the NAFEX window we see that it gained 0.13 percent and week on week to close at 40, 436 naira 47 kobo to a dollar against the 437 naira 5 kobo to um a dollar as we saw in last week's trans the previous week's transaction and we're seeing that that uptick in naira is it a positive move or is can it be sustained or is this temporary is it something that's just passing by but our analysts will give us further insight to what's going on there we saw also muted trans transactions in the fixed income space continue to see yields dropping down for I mean going up for the for the bonds and the Treasury bills market bearish sentiments are persisting there low demand in that space instruments continue to remain low and then it, it, we, we see that um, a, and, I mean, probably, possibly uh, investors are waiting to cash in on higher yields. But if, for, I mean, Constance on your fixed income deal at Access Bank is going to give us more insights into that. Constance, good morning. How are you doing today? Very well, thank you. Good morning. Thank you for having me. And then, Constance, uh, given the tight liquidity picture that we are seeing right now, how much has this impacted the forex and fixed income market? And tell us what's really driving this. Oh, okay. Um, so last week, we after, immediately after the NPR meeting that held, uh, where the CBN took up the rates from uh, 14 points, from 14 percent to 15.5. Uh, thereafter, we've seen uh, a lot of bearish moment in the secondary market space. Uh, for the liquidity, uh, there's been the debit, as mentioned by the CBN governor, to debit banks across board. Uh, the Sierra. Uh, debit and it was also increased at the NPRO meeting. So we've seen that a lot of banks got debited in the past week or for CRR and this impacted into the liquidity in the system. It was so tight last week. We had OPR rates at 16.25 um, and 17.25 in the market uh, where banks try to fund their, uh, their obligations. We also saw that this also affected um, the movement on the FX side as well, uh, seeing that banks did not have enough liquidity to go for the auction, the bi-weekly auctions are held that week. Uh, we saw that um, 
uh, the liquidity had dried up in the system mm. going into the fixed income space uh, for the treasury bills market to continue to see rates on the rise we even don't have off takers in the market as investors are still mute at this moment mm. waiting to cut in at when yields probably get higher than uh, where it is right now so the last stop Constance, just before you go on, I just want to give a quick outlook into what we would have this week. We know that today is a public holiday and uh, markets are not open, but uh, seeing that we have continued low demand in the market, what are we to expect from the NTB auction on Wednesday? A quick one. Okay, so from the NTB auction, the demo is set to offer a 190 billion across the 91, 182, and 364 days. We expect uh, rates to go up. The last stop rate was about 12 percent, and we are hope, um, foreseeing that this rate will cl close to 13 percent because they are gradually going up. They don't want to hit the markets all out. So it's, um, we've seen a steady increase on every auction. We expect that the one year, especially where the concentration is usually is by the investors, will probably close at 13 percent and above this time mm. uh, we don't expect anything okay. significant and market players are not going to be participating so much at the auction oh that's uh, that's um uh, good news for investors who want to cash in on the fixed income space thank you so much constance onya uh fixed income dealer access bank for sharing your perspective on the program with us thank you uh, so, Ini, that's what we have for the markets. We're looking yeah. uh, ahead for the NTB auction. People are going to be looking for higher yields, and they're probably going to be they're waiting on the sidelines and hoping to cash in. On Just like Ladi is waiting on the sidelines. Yes, waiting on the yes. sidelines. <laughs> waiting on the sidelines, Ladi. You took some time from Ladi. <laughs> Don't worry, we're going to make her pay for it tomorrow. <laughs> She'll pay for it tomorrow. Especially. <laughs> That's wicked. <laughs> All right, now let's look at the crypto space. Now we see the fear green index there, 22 uh, points there. Extreme fear uh, standing in the market there. Let's look at the price of Bitcoin uh, this morning now. Price of Bitcoin this morning is $19,422. That's down 0.05% this morning. And we see volume traded $17.71 uh, billion. So uh, Bitcoin lost that uh, 20K uh, over the weekend. That uh, lost the 19.5 level. We're seeing if uh, Ethereum, they're 1,300 down 0.12%. Uh, small uh, volume uh, compared to what we have normally, $6 billion. Let's bring in my guest now. Uh, that's uh, Alex Kahan, co-founder of MetaNet, uh, joining us uh, from Dubai. Great to have you on the program. Hi, how are you? Yeah, so uh, I've been getting reports from the metaverse uh, industry there. I see that it's getting quite lonely in the metaverse. We're not seeing that much uh, users. And I'm wondering, how are you able to you know, keep your users engaged in the metaverse? Okay, first, first of all, I think that the, the main point and the main goal to, to keep users like, in, in our metaverse is to create and to innovate all the time and to create some entertainments, events, concerts, and not only to, to make like a play to earn as we see like, you know, in a different other projects, but to create a real life inside with, um, with a lot of events and that people will be able to participate and to have some reward from that. And I hear you're planning some kind of live concert on, on the metaverse. How is that going to work, really? Okay, very easy. I can, uh, I can take you, for example, you know, and uh, make a captation of image and uh, turn you into an avatar. And then we create a 3D concert, 3D meta concert. So the user will be able to participate with their own avatar to this, uh, to this concert and, uh, and enjoy the concert where we we'll bring like international artists and also Niger uh, Nigerian uh, um, artists and Nigerian international artists also. We cannot deliver a name right now because we have uh, NDA signed, but uh, I can tell you that it will be really, really um, nice and fun. Right, it'll be great to see how uh, a concert is actually held in Metaverse. Thank you so much. Uh, that was Alex Kahan, co-founder of Metanet. It was great having you. You're welcome. All right, so uh, look at the top uh, outs by market cap, though. See, it's all red. So uh, right now, in a look, the market is not looking so good. Ladi, I've, 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 been even bought over, I've been bought over. I have to attend that Metaverse concert. That's what I'm interested yeah, in. Yeah, we, we, we should attend. And maybe we might, you know, <laughs> Can I get the ticket? We'll, we'll get a ticket okay. for sure. All right. <laughs> I'll lean on you for that. All Thank right. you so much. We'll do it tomorrow better. Okay.
So that's it on the program today. Thank you so much for being a part of Business Morning. Hope it was worth your holiday. But, you know, uh, tomorrow we'll be back here with a fresh episode. Well packed. Great conversations just for you. That's tomorrow. But at 1.30, um, Laddie Williams will be back to give you an update from the world of business. And, of course, uh, tonight at 10. Oh, there's no market today. The equities and the fixed income market are closed. It's a holiday. So we'll do that tomorrow. But 1.30, Laddie will be here. I'm wishing you a restful holiday. I'm in John Mekwa. Enjoy yourself.